having yeah. problems. I can see two already connected to the server. Who is called Ice? Is, is that you, Mikael? Well, I should be me, yes. Ah, nice That's one. <laughs> I just... <laughs> ah, okay. No problems, Mark. Yeah, so if you want to connect also, um, Scott, you have the ID there and you have the password. So, Mark, I'll give you the ID and the password again. Yeah, there you go. So, that's it. So, that's the team viewer ID and that's the password. Okay, let's let's start again for today. Um, Hyper-V. Your understanding of Hyper-V and your experience with Hyper-V. What's your understanding of Hyper-V? What's your experience with Hyper-V? Uh, Stefan, you want to go first? Um, yes, uh, I've been using Hyper-V with Server 2008 or 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, we moved recently to Server 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that uh, with Server 2008 R2, we do have uh, the virtual disk with an extension of .vhd. Mm -hmm. And with 2012, it's with uh, .vhdx. Mm -hmm. And yep. I had a trouble with uh, one of the VMs uh, the other day, and I could not revert back the X1 to the VHD, to the simple VHD, yeah. and I needed to rebuild the whole server. Ah. And, uh, yeah. And something I realized as well is that uh, I could manage uh, remotely my uh, Hyper-V host on 2008 R2 with Windows 7 itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same goes. Uh, for, the same applies uh, for Windows 8, mm -hmm. from which you can manage uh, um, Hyper-V uh, on Server 2012. Mm -hmm. But lately, uh, I think it was a week ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. I already installed Windows 8.1 on mm -hmm. my machine. Yeah. But I couldn't manage my Hyper-V uh, host. I did. Uh, you remember what we talk about the firewall whenever you you need. Um, yeah to enable few stuff under yeah. the firewall to get access to, to, to some remote services. Yeah. I did that. I, I can tell I did disable the, the firewall as well yeah. just to see if I could manage it. But yeah. I, I, I couldn't with Windows 8.1. Um, well, yeah, we'll probably talk about that a bit. You should be able to. There's no reason if you're on the same network. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to. Um, oh, okay, here we go. Here's the big guy. So Zoe, Zoe is online. So guys, after this session, if you need access to the drive, speak with Zoe. Send him an email. Okay. He's the guy to talk to. So he's online now. Hello, Zoe. How are you doing? Okay. So what about you, uh, Mark and, and Mikhail? So your understanding, your experience with Hyper-V. don't have to ask me, David. I was here yesterday. So <laughs> no. Just carry on. <laughs> I am just here for watching. <laughs> oh, okay then, no problem. Um, Mark, what about you? Um, I just started messing around with it actually, so I have pretty limited knowledge of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. I get caught. Yeah. Ah, okay. And yeah. though, so, um, what, what about you? What's your understanding and experience with Hyper-V? Yeah, I know a little bit about it. Uh, the like basic stuff that I've uh, seen in the videos. Uh, I know it's a virtualization solution for Windows, and you can create virtual machines basically. So I mean, as far as I as far as I know about it, it will of I've seen a couple of uh, commands as well, PowerShell commands. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean that's far that that's how far I know about it. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. So. Um, so, okay, so because you just joined, I'll post the ID and the password for you to, to connect to the server. Okay. Yeah, Thank so you. if you look in the chat window, you see the ID and the password. And so, okay. so, we're going to be taking the same the same uh, direction that we took yesterday. We will probably talk of... Um, I hope I didn't just disconnect you guys. Did I disconnect you? Oh. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I was I was so carried away. I just clicked close. Sorry about that, guys. I'm so sorry. So just no, no connect, problem. just connect back to the ID and the password. Sorry about that. What's the uh, there a link to this? Yeah. So that's the ID. No, Team Viewer. So you need Team Viewer client. Oh, Team Viewer. I'm on a Mac, so I'm trying. <laughs> ah, yeah. You can download Team Viewer on Mac also. So Team Viewer. Just just go to um, Google Team Viewer and you see the. Um, I think I have it on here someplace. Ah, okay, yeah. 
can see people connecting back again. Sorry about that again, guys. Okay. So we'll be taking the same direction that we took uh, yesterday uh, when we're doing this. Every, every single thing that we do, we're going to be doing it with partial. And uh, so we get more familiar with partial. Um, so we'll go through everything uh, from top to bottom um, to try to understand. Okay. So two people are connected. Yeah. Three people are connected. If you're just having troubles connecting, let us know. We can try to help you. Okay. So we'll start with the first thing. Um, for you to install Hyper-V, you have to meet some certain requirements. So your boss has asked you to install Hyper-V on the server. Um, so you want to install Hyper-V on the server. Or sorry, you want to purchase a server that you're going to install Hyper-V on. But the thing is, the server has to meet some minimum requirement for you to be able to install Hyper-V on it. You can't just install Hyper-V on every, any, single, any server that you see. There are requirements that the server must meet. So does anyone have any idea what the requirements are to install Hyper-V on a server? So what are the requirements? So if you want to buy a server that you're going to be installing Hyper-V on, what are the things that you'll be looking that can this server do this? Can it do this? I think it needs to have virtualization support, uh, Intel VT or AMD VT technology, or Intel VT technology or AMD V technology on it. Nice one. Nice one. Now, uh, um, forgive me if there's anyone here that is just, um, okay, that I don't like explanation in details, you have to forgive me. So, um, Intel VT AMD V, those are ni nice sounding words, because one of the things that we do in IT a lot of times is we say really, really nice sounding words, but we don't really understand what they mean. So what do you mean? What, what does Intel VT, what does it mean? When they say Intel VT AMD V, what does it mean? So anyone, anyone want to take on that? So Stefan, um, Mac, what, what, what do you understand? What, so what does Intel VT, what does it mean? When they say, so Zoe has given us a requirement. It said, if you want to install Hyper-V on a server, the server must, sup the, the server must support uh, Intel VT or AMD V. But what does Intel VT or AMD V, what does it mean? You hear me, guys? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I was saying that, yeah, like Zoe said, it should be, um, uh, it should support the, it should have the, it should have, sorry, the hypervisitor feature. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, the Intel VT is, is just a feature uh, mm -hmm. for virtualization mm -hmm. provided by Intel um, company, I mean, Intel, Intel processors. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for AMD, yeah. VT. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, it should be enabled in the BIOS. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we should also take into account the x64 uh, capability of the server. Good one. So you're mentioning some things that are really important. So let's write them down. So MS Paint. So um, Zoe mentioned um, Intel VT or AMD V, right? And you've just mentioned something important. You said X64. So does that mean yeah. you cannot install Hyper-V on a, an X86 uh, processor? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But still, that's really good. That's really, really good. But still, no one has explained to me what exactly does it, do we mean by Intel VT or AMD V? Mikhail, you want to go for that or it's... Mac, you want to go for that? Um, it allows, um, and I'm just taking a wild guess, the processing, the, it allows multiple operating systems to run, like it will separate the processes so it can support that's different a, operating systems running at the same time. That's a really, really good point. That's a really, really good point brought up by Mac. Mac is really close, like in terms of his answer. Has anyone ever heard of something called... Ring zero and ring one before. Have you ever heard of it before? Ring zero, ring one. Anyone? Zoe, Mikael, Mark, have you heard of ring zero, ring one before? Ring zero, ring one. Yeah. So let's go. Let's ring zero. I'm trying to connect to this team viewer, but every time I type in the ID, it puts yeah. an N in front of it. Ah. So it says which N fifty seven. I don't know why it keeps doing that. 
Ah, no, I'm not sure why. Let's see. So which, which are you, you're, you've downloaded the client, you've installed the client, right? Yeah, I have the client on here. When I yes, sir. Yes, the remote control mode, not meeting mode. Ah, yeah, exactly. It's not meeting mode. So you need the yeah. remote control mode. Yeah, that, that's right, Mikael. So, because we're, we're not using like the TeamViewer meeting, we're just using TeamViewer to connect to a computer. Is that different? Yeah, exactly. So Something it's, I have to download? Uh, no, it, I think it should be the one. So, it's just TeamViewer remote control is what you need. So I think you can switch between meeting and remote control, like Mikhail said. <laughs> just, just to be, yeah, okay. So actually, so this is the first thing that we'll do. Let's do this. Hold on, I need to speak with you. I need to speak with you. Um, okay, so first thing, I'll come back to explain Intel VT, but first thing that we'll do is on the server, Stefan, if you log into the server and install Hyper-V using PowerShell, so the password for the server is so that's zero and that's dollar dollar. So I want you to log into the server. So don't use Google or anything to just figure out how to install it. Sorry, I just want to say say hello to someone. Back in a minute. Um, R control delete. Where we are. I need to buy a new PC. What do you guys recommend for something that will allow me to run Hyper-V and study for this stuff? Um, install, how do we install Windows feature? Yeah, hello. Um, Sorry. Yeah. And Mark, have you, install the, yeah. Mark yeah, have you been able to connect? Uh, no, it's not. Ah, okay, let me, let me look for the team. I'm reinstalling it. Maybe I did it. So, I team viewer remote control. It's on team viewer. So if, if, you, if you try this link, try this link. Yeah. It's a feature. Just as you know, it's a Windows feature. Just a oh, hint. Is someone typing? Is anyone yeah. typing? <laughs> someone is typing. No. <laughs> <laughs> um. Sorry. Shall I enable it through PowerShell, or I can go through the Windows feature itself? Um. No, PowerShell. So use. use it's PowerShell. a Windows feature, not a module, actually. Yeah. Yeah, when you are around for the partial hangout? Yes. Ah, okay. You remember the the steps that we went through? Do you remember? Um, yes, we went through the list. Yeah. Sorry, wait. Um, get module dash yeah. list available. Mm -hmm. And then we went through uh, the commands. Yeah. And then we said get help dash command, mm -hmm. where we just uh, saw about the, uh, the switches that we can use. Yeah. Um, hold on. So the, the, yeah. <laughs> take your time, come on, take your time, don't worry. We'll, we'll carry on discussing while you're figuring it out. 
So we'll carry on, we'll carry on uh, discussing. Okay, so let's carry on with our discussion. So we said um, we have to have um, x64 processor. We have to have the processor must support Intel VT or AMD V. Is there any other requirement? What about memory requirement? What are the memory requirement of installing Hyper-V? What's the minimum memory that you must have if you want to install Hyper-V? Well, what did you say, uh, Mac? I thought it was 512 per virtual machine, isn't it? 512? Does anyone, there's only one agree. Do you agree or do you disagree with uh, Mac? For you to install Hyper-V, you only need 512 of them. Oh, okay, to install Hyper-V, I'm sorry. I thought you meant to create a virtual machine on there. Uh, no, to, to install Hyper-V uh, on the machine, what's the minimum requirement of Probably like two gigs, maybe, something. Yeah. So, two, is it two gig, right? Is that two gig? I'm uh, just guessing. But I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what do you think, though? What do you, what's the minimum requirement for the memory? I think it's uh, two, 2 GB. 2 GB, okay. What about you, Mikael? What do you think? Uh, it can actually be 512 megabyte, actually, I think. Because Hyper-V itself doesn't limit, or minimum requirements is the host itself that sets it. So, guys, do you agree or do you disagree with Mikael? So, Mikael says it can actually be 512. Scott, what do you think? You can type it. Ah, carry on, Zo. What did you say? I think uh, uh, should be 2G because like uh, you are running, already running on host machine, so you will be running Hyper-V on a host machine, so it should be more than 512. It can't be, it can't be 512. Hmm. Actually, to install Hyper-V on the host, all you need is 512. <laughs> so it's the same. It's the same requirement for server um, 2012. So the minimum requirement for installing server 2012 is 512. So for any role you want to install. Now we all know that it doesn't work that way in the real world because you have to calculate what your server will be doing. But if you if we go by theory, the minimum requirement is just 512 of RAM. What about the disk space? What's the minimum disk space required? 32 GB as far as I remember. Yeah. So, do you agree? 32 GB of this space. Yeah, I think so. 32 GB. Yeah. Yeah, Mark. Agree or disagree? Uh, I don't know. Honestly. Yeah, they're right. They're right. It's 32 GB. So, okay. So now we've discussed that. We've mentioned um, X64, um, Intel VT or AMD V. We've mentioned. Um, so for guys that are just just joining, I can see. Ravi Kant and Alexander just joined. So what I'll do is if you look in the chat window, I'll post the ID and the password for you. So if you open Team Viewer, Team Viewer Remote Control and connect to this server. So that's the ID of the server and that's the password. So if you if you connect to the server that we're using, so you can see what we're saying. Okay. Um so that's the minimum requirement for Hyper-V. So yeah, nice one. So what about in terms of, um, we, yesterday we discussed something about architecture, that there are two different types of hypervisor today. And we discussed that there is, um, I can see people, some people are disconnected, about three people are disconnected from the server. Yeah, okay, so there are, there are different types, there are like, different types of hypervisors. There's type 1 and there's type 2 hypervisors. So does anyone know what the difference is between type 1 and type 2 hypervisor? Uh, the different options. I think the um, options have changed. So, so when, when they say type 1 hypervisor, type 2 hypervisor, what do they mean? What's the difference between them? Like there's no, um, they remove some options like uh, floppy drives and things like that. Ah, you're referring yeah. to generation one and generation two. Okay. <laughs> so we're referring, to, we're referring to virtual machines in terms of like the different types of virt virtualization that's available. So there's type one virtualization and there's type two virtualization, but they are different. So um, does anyone, anyone want to go? 
Mikael, you already know the answer, so you can carry on. <laughs> I don't want to answer anything, I'm just watching. <laughs> no, you, you, were, you were around yesterday, you, you mentioned the answer yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, actually, I don't really remember. Actually. <laughs> I get one is uh, let me see. It's the difference is between how you hold the hypervisor. Actually, mm -hmm. far as I remember, correct. I think uh, uh, there is a way like where you can virtualize an application. That's that's the kind of a, a way of doing virtualization. I think that's maybe the reason. Like, I mean, you can virtualize an application like App B. There's a solution where you send an application. It's it's in its own bubble. So it's, it's that application is actually not on the uh, machine where the user is using it. Mm -hmm. it's somewhere else, but it's been in a it's been in its own bubble. So that's the kind of virtualization. Probably that's the difference uh, in in these two virtualization. Like it's host-based virtualization, and then there is a server-based virtualization. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Am I close? Okay, okay. So I, I actually like um, Stefan. Let me let me yeah. bubble the server for a minute. Yeah, I just pushed him a bit forward there. <laughs> I had to get help for him. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why we do why we do this. One of the reasons why we do this is to is to challenge ourselves. So well done for trying, Stefan. Okay. So before we mentioned something about Ring Zero, right? So let's go Ring yeah. Zero. So on your operating system. Look at this. There we go. Look at this. You have Ring Zero, right? And what is running in Ring Zero? The kernel. So basically, think of this as your CPU. So on your CPU, you have rings. So Ring Zero is where the kernel runs. What is the kernel? It's very hard to explain, really. It's right. it's, 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 it's uh, kernel is something which is uh, is which basically uh, a bridge in between you and the hardware. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, what else yeah, is the kernel? Uh, that's the most accurate answer. It actually is a bridge between everything. Hmm? Uh, it basically makes contact with every different part of hardware and device drivers and so on, and sends messages forward. On your on your Windows system, if I take, take control of the mouse, someone is controlling the mouse. <laughs> Let me control the mouse. <laughs> yeah. So, what on your Windows system? What is running in your as your kernel? It's your Windows operating system, right? Your Windows operating system is the one that runs as your kernel, right? On Windows system, right? Yeah, I think so. Agree or disagree? Anyone? So in, yeah, yeah, it's your Windows operating system. So your Windows operating system runs in Ring Zero of your CPU, and the thing is, the operating system is designed that it cannot run anywhere else but Ring Zero. Because anything that runs in Ring Zero can perform some tasks that some other applications cannot perform. So if you're running in Ring Zero, you can assign the memory. You can say to an application, this memory belongs to you. You can say to an application, you know, this memory, you can't use this one. You can say to an application, this disk space belongs to you. So you're basically controlling the hardware when you're running in Ring Zero, right? So the operating system is designed to run in, run in Ring Zero. And then you can see Ring 1, you have your device driver running in Ring 1. Then Ring 2, you have like your device driver. Then Ring 3, you have your applications like your Microsoft Office and all that. So all those ones are running in Ring, Ring 3. Because your Mi Microsoft Office, you don't want Microsoft Office to have the rights to be assigning memory, do you? But here's the key point. Here's the key point is when we talk about hardware assisted virtualization, Intel VT, or, um, or um, AMDV. This is what we mean. Um, this will really help you. Pay attention to this. This will really help you. What it basically means is that Intel and AMD, they've designed the CPU. So let's go back to the pictures. They've designed a CPU that has this. So ring zero. So let's scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Here we go. Look at this. 
they've designed a CPU that has another ring in it called ring minus one. So, because the hypervisor is basically, because, for example, what do you mean by hypervisor? When you say supervisor, so think of the operating system as the supervisor. So it supervises the hardware. It assigns the hardware. But hyper is bigger than super, right? That's where you get the word hypervisor from. So hypervisor means this one is even greater than the operating system. So this one loads before the operating system. It has more power than the operating system. It assigns memory to the operating system. So basically what you're saying is we've designed a CPU that has a special ring called ring minus one that the something greater than the operating system can load into this ring and control the hardware from here. So that's basically what they mean. So is that clear to everyone? Is that clear at all? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone? Anyone? Is that anyone has any question about that? Clear. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that's basically, so when they're talking about Intel VT, AMD V, what they're saying basically is a CPU that has ring minus one. Because not all CPU have ring minus one. A standard CPU just has ring zero, you can see here, again, you can see ring zero is just your operating system, you activate your user applications. But then when you're talking about ring minus one, that is where your hypervisor run. That is where you need your hardware assisted virtualization. So now that we've discussed that, so let's go on. So, so whenever you hear the word Intel VTA, MDV, hardware assisted virtualization, you understand exactly what you're talking about. So when you're talking about type one hypervisor, what type one hypervisor simply means is, in fact, I think, yeah, look at this. We even have a picture here that can help us. Look at this. <laughs> so you can see type one, type two. Under type 1, you have your hardware, and immediately after your hardware, what do you have? Your hypervisor. hypervisor. Then you have your virtual machines. Why type 2? You have your hardware. Immediately after the hardware, what do you have? Your operating system, and then the hypervisor. So type 1 will be something like uh, VMware ESXi. Type 2 will be something like VMware Workstation. So VMware Workstation runs on top of your operating system, right? Same thing with Oracle VirtualBox. So you have Oracle VirtualBox. You download it from Oracle's website. You double click on it. You install it on your operating system. So it runs on top of your operating system. So it's not something that is interacting directly with the hardware. It has to go via the operating system. So that's what we mean by type 1 and type 2. So example of type 1 is VMware ESXi. Example of type 2 is um, VMware Workstation, Oracle VirtualBox, any virtualization. Does this mean that uh, VMware, uh, VMware or VirtualBox, does this mean that VMware VirtualBox are software-based virtualization? Exactly. Thanks very much for that. Thanks very, very much for that time, Zoe. So type 1 hypervisor is hardware-based virtualization. Type 2 hypervisor is software-based virtualization. So which means it's running on top of an operating system. It's not interacting directly with the hardware. Type 1 hypervisor is interacting directly with the hardware. It's running in ring minus 1. So let's move a step further. So here's my question to you now. Hyper-V, is it type 1 hypervisor or is it type 2 hypervisor? What do you think? So your opinion, guys. So Hyper-V... I would say type 2. Type two. type 2. Type 2. So everyone is saying type 2. <laughs> so Except me, type 1. <laughs> Mikhail, I know why you're saying type 1. <laughs> I expected you to keep quiet in this place. <laughs> in, with this question, I expected you to keep quiet. <laughs> so Ravikant Rav, said type 1. Yeah, oh, no, we can't hear you, Ravikant. You may need to unmute yourself. So you may want to unmute yourself. So just unmute yourself and, and you'll be able to talk and we can hear you. Okay, so <laughs> Mikhail, Mikhail says type 1, Ravikant says type 1. So Ravikant, I'll be interested to hear why you think Hyper-V is type 1. Is there any reason why you think Hyper-V is type 1? Why? Uh, it's because when you install Hyper-V, it installs something like in the kernel of your computer. Yeah, it basically takes 
over your computer, basically. Your clothes, your clothes, boy. <laughs> boy, actually, you're 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 definitely right. Your clothes, boy, you're definitely right. So, I know with the way that we've talked, with what we've talked, that you know, type two is software based, so it runs on top of the operating system, and with the way Hyper-V works, it is deceiving to think this is a type two hypervisor, because first you have to install your operating system, which is Windows. Then after that, you go to install a row called Hyper-V. So it makes it look like, well, this is type 2 because you're installing it on top of an operating system. But actually, that's a bit deceiving because when you actually install Hyper-V and it installs the hypervisor on your machine, it actually loads itself into Ring 0 and boots before the operating system boots. So, if for example, if you just do that's a quick, quick start of Hyper-V type 1. So you see a lot of people talk about, so for example, yeah, there you go. Hypervisor, you can see classification. Um, it's under classification type 1 or type 2. Ah, someone, someone's mic is making noise, so I may have to mute everyone. Mark. Me? Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'll just, I'll just mute everyone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let, let's. Okay. So if we go here, it says ten things you must know about Hyper-V. Let's see. Let's see. It's also not to us. Well, that's not what we're talking about. Let's go for what we're looking for. Okay. It says Hyper-V is a Type One or native hypervisor. This means it has direct access to the physical machine hardware. It differs from Virtual Server 2012. So. Hyper-V, even though it, it looks it looks as if it's type 2, because it looks as if you're installing it on top of the OS, but what happens when you actually install the hypervisor is that it basically loads itself before it loads the operating system. So if you can get this, so the operating system that you've installed actually becomes a virtual machine. Yes, but uh, how, do, how do I know that... that that Hyper-V is installed at ring zero, maybe I, I can install VMware and then, uh, I mean, I can say it's type one, but it's actually it's not type one, it's type two. So is there a way I can check that, uh, like some way, like in, through some command at what is loading first sort of thing like that you can do in Linux? Uh, not really. So the, the, of course, what type one and type two basically means is the way they interact with the hardware. Type one hypervisor, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, type one hypervisor, basically interacts directly with the hardware. So if you go classification, runs directly on the host hardware to control the hardware and manage the guest operating system. Why type two runs within a conventional operating system. So they gave examples of type one and it said the um, type one and type two and Hyper-V should be under type one hypervisor. Because that, that, that's why it is. Because this is what happens. Let me look for the right picture when you install Hyper-V. And there's a picture that Microsoft provides of, yeah, here we go. Um, parent partition. Is there a parent partition? Hyper-V. Let's, let's, let's see a good picture for this. Hyper-V parent partition. Images. Mm, anything good? Yeah, here we go. So when you install Hyper-V, this is what happens. So it loads, so you see what, what, what they call parent partition here, right? So this parent partition is actually the operating system that you've installed. Now your operating system that you've installed has become basically a virtual machine itself. It has to go through the hypervisor before it can access the hardware. So it becomes the parent partition why the other operating systems, the other guest operating systems that you install are now child partitions. But we won't go into too much details about that. The only thing you need to do to know in 7410 is just to be aware. You don't need to go into details yet. Yeah, well, um, I think when you get to 7413, 7414, you're basically just doing mainly Hyper-V Hyper and system center virtual machine manager and system center operations manager and all that. So all you just need to be aware is Hyper-V is a type one hypervisor because when you install when you install the Hyper-V role, it actually loads itself in ring one and loads itself before it loads the operating system. 
and then the, the operating system that you've installed becomes something called a parent partition. They won't ask you this in the exam, but it's just so that you're aware of it. Um, so let's move, a, let's move a step further. So ways to manage. So now we have our hypervisor. We've, we've, dis, we've defined our requirements. We've explained what the requirements mean, right? So the first task that we give to to Stefan was to install Hyper-V on this machine so we can play with it. So everything that we want to do, we want to do with PowerShell. So uh, are you comfortable with installing Hyper-V using just PowerShell? Uh, no. 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 Anyone comfortable with doing that? Mikhail, you want to try? Sure. Uh, first, we can look at uh, get help for uh, Windows features that lets you See, here we go. Basically, in B we get Windows feature, list all the features that's available on the server itself. It also lists what's installed and what's not installed. So here is the help command. So we type, uh, oh, that was too long. Windows feature. And that will load a list of all the features that's installed and not installed. Someone disconnected. Yeah, I think someone got disconnected. So whoever got disconnected, oh, I think it's Mac. Yeah, carry on. I'll post the thing again. So we have to scroll up until you find uh, Hyper-V. It's sorted by letters, so it should be H somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Hyper-V, it says available. So now we did took a look at the help for install Windows feature. It says install Windows feature dash name an optional feature slash restart if that has to be done too. So that means we can use in, we install Windows feature with the name Hyper-V. That's mm -hmm. listed right there. Yeah. So let's do that. Nice one. Name. Actually, you don't have to type the name, but for now we do it. And then we take restart because when you install no, Hyper-V. Before you present her, hold on. So now you want to install Hyper-V. So yeah. you disinstall the management tools for Hyper-V. That is not correct. It will only install the feature Hyper-V. So how do I now install the management tools all at once? I don't want to install them, you know, I don't want to install Hyper-V now and then come back and install Hyper-V server manager and then come back and install um, and then come back and install Hyper-V PowerShell module. I want to install everything all at once. Is there a, a is there a way to install everything all at once? Yes, there is actually. Uh, as far as I know, you can separate by comma. Mm -hmm. And we know remote administration tool is a feature in Windows Server, mm -hmm. RSAT, to mm -hmm. be correct. Mm -hmm. It's listed at RSAT, and if we scroll down, we should find Hyper-V remote management tools. We can install both of these tools at once mm -hmm. by using that name. Yeah. So we don't have to install that and that one separate. We can just use that one. Oops, yeah. what happened? Yeah. And I think someone connected and maybe moved the mouse. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but hold on. Yeah, you've given you've given a good answer, but still that's not what I'm looking for because there's another way to do it that is straightforward than this. Mm. As I know, there is such... Does anyone yeah. want to? Does, does anyone have an idea? So is, there's another way to do it that will actually do it without you having to type all this. Stefan? I was reading something about um, install management tools. Exactly. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's yeah. an option to install management tools or to install all sub features. So, um, Mikhail, all you need to do is if you type just the iPhone sign after Hyper-V, and then press and then keep going tab tab so space then hyphen hyphen i don't know yep. what the sign is hyphen is the minus that? the minus oh yeah yep. the dash yeah then keep going yeah there you go can you see those two that you oh, yeah sorry. can you Three see management tools exactly oh, yeah. so there's another one at the top that says include all sub features hmm. so what you need to, all you just need to do is type you say install hyper v but put in this um, switch to say install management tools and you install everything at once you don't have to um, um, come back to do it or you don't have to type them in one by one so if you carry on and do that and then 
we'll go from there so we'll have a lot of play with hyper-v using powershell so guys if you if you came here today without yet <laughs> reading through the the topics that we discussed uh we're, we're in for something because <laughs> everything that we're doing we're not going to be using the gui well maybe we'll just use the gui to explain but we'll be using powershell for every single thing okay so now we're installing hyper-v on this machine so why yes, is it yeah why Hyper-V is installing on this machine? There are two generations of virtual machines that you can create on Hyper-V. Or there are two types of virtual machines that you can create on Hyper-V. Does anyone know what they are called? Does anyone know what, what those are called? So there are two generations of virtual machines that you can... That you can um, it's also think about it like in physical terms. So you have like maybe new hardwares nowadays. So there are two types in, in the Hyper-V virtual world. Um, I, I would refer to the .VHD and .VHDX. Not I'm really. Not sure this is what you're going to Not yeah. really. It's simple because we gave the word. Does anyone else know? What do you think? Or Mac? What do you think? Or Ravikant? What do you think? Actually, Stephanie referred to the hard disk. That's two types. Of yeah. the generation itself. Yeah. So, um, Stefan, um, I, yeah, I think there's the a newer, newer feature in the the processor is one thing, I think. Um, you're not really, you're talking about some of the maybe benefit or advantages, but not yet, like, in terms of, oh, okay, sorry, no, no, no problems, why we can't. Um, so, in, in, what we mean is in terms of the generation. So, the just so, Mikhail or Mark, do you want to help? Mark, what do you think? Is this the... Uh, gen 1, Gen 2? Exactly, yeah, one. exactly. Okay. So they're just Generation 1 and Generation 2. That's why Hyper-V calls them. So you have two types of virtual machines you can create. So whenever you want to create a virtual machine, you right-click, you go New Virtual Machine. The first One of the first things that it will ask you is, do you want to create a Generation 1 virtual machine or a Generation 2 virtual machine? So right. my next question to you, Mark, because you answered this for us, is, so what is the difference between Generation 1? Bless you. So what is the difference between generation one and generation two? When will you, as a system administrator, when will you use generation one? When will you use generation two? Uh, I think that gen one would be when you need like some of the older features that are not commonly used anymore, like floppy drives. And um, I don't remember what the other options were, but I know that gen one has more of the legacy Hardware options. Yeah, so that's that's a good one. So I'll write that down. So Gen one. So it says more legacy hardware. And you said floppy, right? Yeah. yeah. What else? Uh, what else was in there? I think uh, Pixie boot like uh, booting through the network option in Gen 2. Uh, yeah, okay. So Zoe is saying something here. Zoe, Zoe said Gen 2 has something called Pixie boot. Okay. Yeah. What else? Anyone else? Generation 1, Generation 2. What are the differences? And I think uh, there's also an option with the NIC teaming where like you got a couple of more options on the NIC card or on your network adapter where you can program stuff on top of it to like capture certain packets or something like that on Gen 2 maybe. Gen 2? Yeah. Uh, okay, let me put a star beside, beside that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just put a little star beside that. <laughs> so he said, uh, capture packets. So what else? Come on, guys. They are, they are much more than this one. Generation 1, Generation 2. What you, you, you are yet to mention the main reason why you want to use Generation 1. There's a main reason why you want to use Generation 1. What, what can you think of? There's a particular reason why you want to use Generation 1 or Generation 2. If you carry on, just think about it. I'll be back in a minute.
Oh, you here? Hello. I'm here, Rob. Yeah. I was asking for Sue. Yeah, sorry guys. Um, yeah, this is the call for mom. Okay. Uh, Comports and. Uh, oh, so the, the, the Babicon says generation two because in the future, if we want to use generation two, like 64 terabyte hard drive, do you agree with that? 64 terabyte hard drive, do you agree with that? Generation two supports 64 terabyte hard drive. Who agrees with this? Yeah. 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 Big. I think the 32-bit, 64-bit option as well for like the backward compatibility with other operating system. Hello? Hello, sir. Yeah, hello, sir. Oh, you know what? I think it has something to do with the boot process. Ah, ah, okay. Well, I'm going to move my point immediately. I'm going to call you, but 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 I'm going Ah, yeah, my, my, my chest, yeah, my chest, yeah, thanks, sir. yeah, chest, sir. Um, also because of memory, where Gen 2 can support uh, much more RAM compared to Gen 1. <laughs> so, okay, someone mentioned 64 terabytes, let me put that one in star also. <laughs> Was it something with the boot partition? Boot partition, what is it with boot partition, Mac? What is it? Uh, I thought it had something to do with like the UEFI, something more secure. UEFI, nice one. More secure, nice one. UEFI, UEFI. Then you said more secure. Hmm. What else? Another thing is the it's the iSCSI thing. It is SCSI. Mm -hmm. SCSI. What what is it about SCSI, Mikael? Uh, it's not virtualized like ID in generation one. It connects directly to the VM bus in the hypervisor. So where is SCSI available? Is it is it available in generation one or generation two? It's only available in generation two, but it's available in generation one too. But it supports booting, to be correct. Support in generation two. In generation two. Yeah. Hmm. Nice one. So what else, guys? There's one particular. Okay, let me ask this question. You are an administrator. You, you, I mean, you have all these new hardwares, new softwares that your company just bought for you to play with. Yeah. Is there any reason in the world why you want to create a machine that is generation one? Because many people still use machines that are generation one. But what's the reason? Why would you want to create a machine that is generation one? when you can create a machine that is generation 2 Stefan I think oh, I uh... say, yeah I, would, I was about to say something like uh, if you are using uh, already a VM hmm? that has been created on uh, Windows 2008 or 2 platform hmm? and you just want to migrate or to move it sorry hmm? to Windows 2012 for hmm? you to be able to manage the VM, hmm. you should uh, keep the, uh, I mean, you should not convert it to uh, generation 2, it should be kept in gen 1. Yeah, backward compatibility, I guess. That's a really nice one, because there's something important. Look at this, I want you to, hopefully we can find it. Generation 2, <laughs> not generation 2 Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> when generation 2 type of it. by the way what is on the generation 2 pokemon by the way <laughs> come on man <laughs> <laughs> so it's, not, yeah, it's interesting let me see what generation 2 pokemon looks like <laughs> uh, okay that is <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> <Cute one. laughs> <laughs> nice one <laughs> okay whatever <laughs> generation 2 okay Generation 2 virtual machines, look at this about them. Microsoft, intro introduction to Generation 2 virtual machines. Hmm. They should tell us something about the operating system, the devices. They tell us about the operating system. Um, let's see what they have to say at the top. Uh, network and boot other storage. Let's see. 
Welcome to Health 2012. Hmm. Let's see. Um, look at this. Can you see that? Let me make it bigger, much bigger. It says the following guest operating systems are supported as generation two virtual machines. Windows Server 2012 Auto, Server 2012, Windows 8.1, Windows 8. Very few infrastructures use only these machines in their infrastructure without having Server 2008. Some even still have server 2003. Some even still have. I have a project that I'm working on for a company that that has a server server 2000. <laughs> so I don't. Yeah, that's a really good one added the backwards compatibility because most companies haven't moved forward yet. So yeah, exactly. So that that's one of the things. So if you want to install and the operating system, you want to install server 2008 on it. You can't use generation two. Because these are the only guest operating systems that are supported as Generation 2 VMs. So if you want to install Server 2008, you have to use Generation 1. Mm -hmm. So that's the big one. That's the big one for many infrastructure. That's one of the big ones why when you're creating as an administrator, you'll be like, no, I'm not going to be creating Generation 2. I'll be creating Generation 1. Because I know this server, we're going to be installed Server 2008 out to Service Pack 1 or something on it. We're not going to be installing Server 2012. But if you're going to be installing Server 2012 R2 on it, why not go for Generation 2? Because you have more features, right? But if not, you're going to be installing Server. You can't install it. So look at this: Generation 2 Linux virtual machines will not boot unless the secure boot option is disabled. So again, if you want to use secure boot option and the machine you're planning to install is a Linux virtual machine. Better not install it because otherwise you have to disable your secure boot. So that leads us back to this page. One of the things um, that this one supports is something called uh, Max said secure, but we'll call it secure boot. So here's what we'll do to, to understand this. So let's log into this server. And Mac, if you create a VM for us, use the GUI. No need to use the um, no need to use the PowerShell for now because we want to learn something together. So create a VM for us. Use the GUI. So we want to go through something important together. Did you see me? Or... Yeah. Yeah. Carry on, Mac. You. So go ahead. So how would you create? Um, a virtual machine using the GUI from here. Yeah, good one. So, mm -hmm. by the way, guys, just just for a poll, like how many of you use Hyper-V in your infrastructure? Oops, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. So if you create a virtual machine, call it test one. You're getting there slowly. Yep. Yeah? There we go. New virtual machine. Nice one. Yep. Yeah? So just call it test one. Yep. Yeah? Save it in the default location. And no space. Let, let's not put space. It's as a best practice, computer names, not advisable to put space in them. And next. You can click on next. Yeah, let's pause here for a minute because this is what we want to discuss now. So now here we go. We have the choice of choosing generation one or generation two. It says this virtual machine generation provides the same virtual hardware to the virtual machine as previous versions of Hyper-V. But look at generation two. It says this virtual machine generation provides support for features. That's the main goal. You have more features such as secure boot. So let's start with secure boot. So what is secure boot? Mikhail, I'll go for you first. When we talk about the rings earlier, we're talking about the ring zero, one, two, and three, right? Yeah. 
basically ring zero no wait uh, basically secure boot is like at ring zero so it makes sure no drivers can inject to ring zero and basically take over the computer is it no, it, is it no drivers or particular drivers uh, particularly malware drivers that are not signed by Microsoft that's the good word signed so that is absolutely correct Mikael so what Mikael is saying is there are two types of drivers yeah so drivers are the things that <clears throat> for example you plug in your keyboard your keyboard has a driver driver are the things that translates the language of the operating system to the hardware so the hardware can talk to the operating system so when you load your machine it loads the kernel loads the operating system and then loads the drivers immediately after that so that's why you see like what Mikhail said you see um ring zero you have your kernel ring one you have your drivers so it loads your drivers immediately after loading the os so what what some attackers can do is that because when you're booting your machine do you have any antivirus software that is scanning everything no you don't there's no antivirus software that is scanning the code when you're booting your machine so the antivirus software only comes in ring 3 right under applications that's where your antivirus software comes in so what some attackers do is they will create malicious software as drivers so that it can load when the system is booting up so that way your antivirus software has no chance <laughs> it's already loaded when the system is booting up so what microsoft has now done is that if you want to create drivers that work with our operating system bring it to us we'll test it and then we'll sign it and say this driver is valid sort of like the certificate signing that we have nowadays so microsoft will sign the driver and windows 2000 and windows 8 is particularly created that way drivers that are not signed will not be loaded so it's for security so only drivers that we've signed and we've verified will be loaded so if you've plugged in if you've bought a device off of ebay and that device has a driver that is not yet signed by microsoft and you need to use that device immediately before you even log into windows that device won't work because windows won't load the driver because it's not signed before windows will load the driver windows is like i want you have to be a signed driver there's a way to disable it the way to disable it is when you're starting your machine press f8 yeah and select the option to disable and uh, driver signing so disable yeah so let, actually you can see we can see a picture of that disable so when you're booting up so when you press f8 when your machine before your machine starts booting you can disable driver signature enforcement um so let's go pictures yeah here we go i'm sure that we'll have some pictures images here we go can you see that disable driver signature enforcement so that's the way to di disable secure boot but by by default generation 2 virtual machines support this feature called secure boot so only drivers that are signed will be loaded so that's what we mean so nice one thanks very much for that Mikhail. secure boot so the next one scotty boot who wants to take that not Mikhail anymore so let's go from Mikhail. let's go forward ravikant i know you can talk but just type it but since Ravi can't, can't talk because the mic has a problem, let's go to Stefan. So, next feature is a SCSI boot. So, what, do, what does it mean by SCSI boot? Um, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> so, get ready, we are coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can like tell the pixie board, but I don't know the scuzzy board. <laughs> I like that. You're trying to you're trying to pick your questions now, though. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that one. I don't want this one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we're so back. We're, we... we're back to you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> or you want to attempt it, Stefan? Yeah. Scuzzy boots. What do we mean by scuzzy boots? Uh, a device that's not ID, maybe like an external set of hard drives, or uses a different controller than the ID uses. Yeah. So maybe it requires different uh, drivers. You're, you're right, but how does, how does that apply to Generation 1, Generation 2? How does that what? How, how does it apply to Generation 1, Generation 2? Um, 
much direction. So we're back to you now, Mikael. <laughs> <laughs> I just read my mic. Well, SCSI stands for Small Computer System Interface, right? <laughs> yep. It's, it's like a serial attached uh, bus to the hard drive. It differs from EDA. It's actually faster instead of the big cable that you have in IDE. Mm -hmm. And SCSI booting is a feature of the UF5, which exists with Generation 2, actually. Mm -hmm. That's as far as I know. Yeah, okay. So actually, let, let's do this. So let's create this VM. So let's go back. Test 1, Generation Did you 1. A virtual hard drive that is SCSI, is that what they mean? Huh? We'll see. <laughs> let's let's okay. let's see together. Uh let's cancel. Oh, is my with messaging me? Um let me I think someone someone does didn't get the invite and he wants to join. So let me quickly send the invite to him uh for the event so he can join. Because I think he's been it's been it's one of the guys that Ah, okay. So let, let's carry on, guys. Okay. So let's create a VM. Um, test one, generation one. Um, let's just create one. Yeah, next, next. Yeah, we don't mind. Next, finish. Yeah, so here we go. We have a virtual machine that is generation one virtual machine. So we can install server 2012, it doesn't matter, server 2008, doesn't matter, anyone that wants to install on this generation 1. So let's create another one that is generation 2. Let's go next, test 1, generation 2, VM. And we'll select generation 2. And let's go next, 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 finish. This is what SCSI boot means. Look at this. We have this generation one. Let's go under settings. Look at the first hard drive. What is it? It's an IDE controller, right? So what that means is generation one, you can add, if I go and add hard drive, I can add a hard drive and I can even add this SCSI controller, right? But this very first controller that will boot the operating system that has the hard drive that the operating system is on has to be an IDE. It cannot be SCSI. So the hard drive in generation one that will boot the operating system that the operating system sits on has to be connected to an IDE controller. It cannot be SCSI. Now you can have other drives that are SCSI as data drives, but the one that will boot the operating system, it cannot be SCSI. And we all know the difference in the view world. How many of you still use IDE in the view world? I mean, you remember your whole IDE drive, right? Your lovely IDE drive. The one that you have to put jumpers. <laughs> How many people remember jumpers? I'm sure you do, Mark. Do you remember jumpers, right? Where we have to set master and slave. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The old boys coil drives. <laughs> so how many of you use this in the in the real world in your physical machines? No. So imagine because these things they are not only limited in terms of like even the way they look, in terms of like how many hard drives you can add, they are also limited in terms of their speed. SCSI drives are fast much faster than IDE drives. But here's the thing is that generation one, you can only boot from an IDE drive. So you have to boot from this old model drive. SCSI drives look like this, by the way. So, SCSI drives. They look much different. Yeah, here we go. That's a good one. So, here we are. So, this is what SCSI drives look like. So, but what they've now done is, if, let's, let's close this and let's go to Generation 2. And go Settings. Now, look at this in Generation 2. The hard drive that you're booting from is connected to a SCSI controller. That is what they mean by SCSI boot, which has faster performance. Yeah. So that's what they mean by SCSI boot. 
in generation one, you cannot boot from a SCSI drive. You can have SCSI drive as data drives, but you have to boot from an IDE drive. Whereas in generation two, you can now boot directly from a SCSI drive. So that's what they mean by SCSI boot. So is that clear? <laughs> yeah. So um, Stefan and Ravikant, mainly IDE in generation one, OS compatibility also. Yeah, sure. No, very nice, Ravikan. Very nice. Okay, so let's go back again. So generation two, they said secure boot, cozy boot. They said pixie boot. So Zo, you volunteered for this. So Zo, pixie boot. Yeah, pixie boot is basically a sim like a simple simple option to boot up on a network, uh, like boot up through the network basically, uh, and get like let's say if you're installing a machine. There are a couple of ways to install the OS on it. Like you can install through a USB flash drive. You can put a CD in it. But through the Pixie Boot, there is an option which is much more convenient. Like you put an image on a server, mm -hmm. and through the Pixie Boot, you can define it uh, like the IP address of the server, and it can load load the images from over there and, and install the operating system. Very nice, though. Very nice. Very nice explanation of Pixie Boot. But my question is this: So, are you saying that we cannot? Pixie boots on a generation one virtual machine. Is that uh, one? Yes. So let's go around. Yes or no? Mac, can we Pixie boot from a generation one VM? Because <laughs> <laughs> Zoe said, he's explained wonderfully what Pixie boots does or what we use it for. I would say no, since it yeah. says on uh, Gen 2 that you can boot from. Okay. So no, Zo. No, Mac. Mikael, do you agree or do you disagree? Mikael is gone. Hello, Mikael. Yeah, after yesterday, I have to disagree, but... Because <laughs> it's, it's a kind of a trick. It says PXC, but using standard network adapter. Hmm. There is something in generation one called legacy network, legacy network adapter. Mm -hmm. That is basically emulates a uh, Intel adapter. Mm -hmm. that allows you to boot over network too, but it has to be done in a different way, I think, nice. than generation two. Yeah, okay. So, so Zo says so it's, no. Um, it's kind of a mind trick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Zo says no, Max says no, Mikael says yes. So now, here we go. Stefan, what do you say? So you were you side in? Do you want? <laughs> so Mikael is standing alone now. Do you want to join him or do you want to join, join Zo and uh, Mark? <laughs> well, Mikael's point is uh, yeah quite good. I was thinking about it as well, and uh, um, but I would I would agree with Zo in saying that um, uh, it's not available. I think what he said hmm. in Gen uh, two compared to Gen one. Hmm, okay. So let's, I let's... think you need to enable this option through the BIOS, basically. So that's why I'm saying that it's only compared with Gen Gen two. Hmm. So the Gen two BIOS are more than one. So I'm okay. right, but a trick. <laughs> it's a trick. You're right, yeah. but a trick here it says it says PXE booting using standard network adapter. That, yeah, that's the point. The... So so Mikel is right. So that's the point. The point is it didn't say. He didn't say, he says, it's supposed to secure boot. It's supposed to cause boot. He didn't say, I'm Pixie boot. He said, I'm Pixie <laughs> boot using a standard network adapter. So you can Pixie boot in generation one virtual machines. You just have to use a legacy network adapter. So let's see that. Let's cancel this. So you go to generation one virtual machine, go on the settings. On the network adapters, you see something here called legacy network adapter. Yeah. If you want to pick the boot, you have to select legacy network adapter. In fact, it will tell you that that is what they use them for. It says use a legacy network adapter to perform a network-based installation. That is pick the boot, right? Network-based installation, right? That is basically pick the boot. Yes. Yeah. So it says in generation one, if you want to pick the boot, you have to use a legacy network adapter. You cannot use just a standard network adapter. So which brings okay. me to another question. What is the difference between a legacy network adapter and a standard network adapter? One of the reasons why we're talking about all these things is, I tell you, like, 
IT people sometimes we have some terms that we throw out, but we don't really understand what they are. You know, like the one that we we explain today, like Intel VT and AMD V. Many people don't even know, like you know, Ving zero and Ving minus one. But we you know we're like, yeah, Intel heavy T, you know, AMD V, and we're like, yeah, you know. <laughs> so we throw that. So legacy network adapter and standard network adapter in Hyper V. What's the difference between the two of them? Anyone want to take on that? Does anyone want to take on that question? What's the difference between legacy network adapter and standard network adapter in Hyper-V? Does it have something to do with the driver? Um, yes, you're right. You're right. You're in the right direction, Mac. Maybe the legacy one. Uh, let's see. So let's go. Your Windows operating system by default comes with certain drivers, right? So for example, you notice that sometimes you just plug some devices to your Windows operating system and you don't need to install any driver on it, right? You will just pick up the hardware and start working. One of them is your monitor. You can install special drivers for your monitor, but sometimes you will just use the basic driver for your monitor. Yeah. So the same thing with Windows. So Windows, not only Windows, Windows and many operating systems, in fact, a lot of operating systems, they recognize by default, they include driver for an Intel, for Intel based network adapters or Intel adapters. There's a particular adapter, Intel E something. So yeah, it's un unsupported now in, in the new version. So which is why you won't see. So the side is unsupported. So so look at this. This one this one I can see as as a clear explanation already. So you enjoyed this this explanation. So So let's go control F because I saw the word emulate now. Oh, let's look for the word. Okay, let's go down a bit. Mm, yeah, there you go. The network adapter that the virtual machine is emulating is an Intel 21140 card. So can you see? So basically what they've done is they've, they took an old Intel card and they built a software that will make your machine look at the software and think, oh, this is an Intel card. I know you, you are Intel 21140. I don't need a special driver for you. I'll just use this driver for you. Did you get that? Yeah. Yeah, but instead, if you use a standard network adapter, you have to install something called integration services. You have to install the guest tools, right? So you have to install the guest tools, which will install the driver. Or in every virtualization application has like a guest tool, which installs a set of drivers. In VMware, you have to install VMware guest tools. In VirtualBox, you have to install VirtualBox guest tools. In every, for example, I'm on I'm on this one now. I'm I'm using um, VMware now. So if I right click here, I can go to the install VMware tools. So VMware tools is basically something that will install drivers on this operating system and this operating system will be able to recognize VMware's virtual adapter. So the same way Microsoft too have their own have their own um guest um, guest guest tools that you can install. So you install the guest tools and when you install the guest tools on on the virtual machine it will be able to recognize all your standard network adapters, all your Hyper-V network adapters. But what if they, they don't have, like, um, the, you can't install guest tools on them? Then you have to use, again, I'm not sure if this is clear. This this will explain the point of some, if you want to use Linux, you may want to use generation one. Because what if your Linux doesn't, you know, have, have a way of understanding Hyper-V's drivers that Microsoft wants to install? 
So which network adapter will you use? Because otherwise it won't recognize any network adapter. So just use the legacy one. They all understand that whole win Intel adapter. They all have drivers for it. So do you get the point? Or is it unclear? So do you get it? Yes, yes, I got it. So yeah. Pretty clear. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. No, what about you, Stefan? Do you get it? Um, and Mark? Yes, but I do. I do. I do have a question. Yeah, sure. David. Um, let's say I'm running Windows 2012. Yeah. Right. I installed the Hyper-V rule. Yeah. And uh, all my VMs, I am. I set them to the Gen 2. Right. Yeah. yeah. Let's say I use this because, like uh, we said previously, it's faster compared to other uh, other controllers. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, all the traffic, right, mm -hmm. coming from the VMs or going out from the VMs, we will just be using uh, the network adapter on the physical host. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, am I gaining in terms of speed? Or it's it will depend. Uh, it will totally. It will definitely depend on the network uh, adapter on the physical uh, network adapter of the, of the physical house. Why it still depends on the so network adapter? Really... Yeah, I, I get your question. Yeah. Carry on. Yeah, why it still depends on the physical yeah. network adapter? They have because when they say an IDE controller, what they've done is they've emulated an IDE controller, a view IDE controller. So when they've said we've mm -hmm. emulated a SCSI controller, what they've done is emulated a view SCSI controller. So which means the same limitations that apply to a SCSI controller, uh, your physical SCSI controllers apl apply to this one. And the same limitations that apply to your IDE controller applies to this one. So the same way with the okay. network adapter, the same limitations. And one, one good thing about the standard network adapter is because it's it's built by the manufacturers of of this one themselves of the virtualization software themselves yeah when you install the drivers and the drivers work with it you can get way more more performance from them and not only more performance you can get more features from them also because they can not only just build because for example your whole standard um intel adapter may not support many features but this mm -hmm. one they can put many features in terms of software and write it on the on that software for the adapter that they are creating and then you can get more features from it but what okay. they've now done okay. that yeah so what they've now done in generation 2 is say generation 2 if i go generation 2 and go on the settings you won't find anything called legacy network adapter here because now on generation 2 you can pick the boot using the standard network adapter there's no need so that's why why this article says legacy network adapter um, is going away or they are retiring it something like that yeah legacy network okay. some, yeah so legacy network adapter is being retired now in generation two because now you can pick the boot without legacy network adapter so the only reason why they put it in generation one if you go back to generation one is because if you want to pick the boot you you need to use legacy network adapter although you still have the standard network adapter so yeah, does that answer the question? Okay, so that answers the question. So let's let's see if we can quickly yeah. find finish the last. And um, Mikhail knows this. The reason why we have to understand all these terms one after the other because you get questions in your exam about them. And then look at the final one. They said they said guest operating systems must be running at least several 2012 64-bit versions of Windows 8. So that's the only operating system you can install on this one, generation one, generation two. So let's move on to the next one, memory. So this is interesting because we discussed this one yesterday. So if we go on the settings, on the memory, um, we have startup RAM here. What does that mean? Because we have to be able to, we have to be able to explain how, what all these things mean. That's our job as system admin. You go into an infrastructure, they're asking you, to, you, you have to be able to understand what's the implication of using this one versus the implication of using this one. Like, if we do use startup RAM, this is what it will cost. If we use this other one, this is what it's gonna cost. If we use this other one, it will, it will work, it will be compatible with this operating system. If we don't use this one, we won't be able to use this operating system. So we have to be able to understand what all this means. So if your if your manager comes to you and says, you know, there's this thing called startup farm, just go ahead and enable it. You can say, well, startup farm, this is exactly what it does. <laughs> so we probably don't want to use this one or something. So anyone wants to explain startup farm? So what does startup farm do? Or what does it uh, mean? I think when the when it the when the 
when it's done boots up, that's the minimum amount of RAM it will require to boot up. Like 512 should be there as a startup RAM for it to utilize. Do you agree, um, Mark and Mikhail and Vavikan? Do you agree? So, so said that's the minimum RAM that is needed. Yeah, I think there's a that's the absolute minimum. It needs to start the virtual machine, and then you can it'll change. Uh, you have the dynamic memory set after it boots up. Ah, so. Max said something interesting. He said, this is the one that he will use to start the virtual machine, right? Right. But then it will go down after it boots up, right? Yeah, you can, if you have the dynamic memory set, then it's, you can nice change one. it and it will fluctuate. Nice, nice answer. Nice answer, Mark. So Mark has now said, okay, this is the one it will use. He said, except if you have the dynamic memory set, then it will flunk to it. So Mikhail, you want to expand more on that for us? Explain to us, Mikael. Help us to understand. Yeah, Star RAM is the RAM you assign the virtual machine when it starts up from the memory. Mm -hmm. So, say you assign 1 GB at startup. That means the hyperresolve will reserve 1 GB for the machine mm -hmm. and utilize all that memory all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, if you enable dynamic memory, it will, as Mark said, differ. Yeah. Nice one, nice one, Mikhail. Nice one. Ravi can you can type your answer. Okay, so this what this is what Mikhail and, and Mark just explained, which is absolutely correct. Is that if you set startup RAM, let's say this host machine has four gig of RAM, and you come here and set a startup RAM of two gig. So what it means is that two gig is absolutely reserved for this virtual machine. No other operating system or application can use that 2 gig for any reason. So whether this virtual machine is using that 2 gig or not, it is reserved for it. So that's what it means by startup RAM here. Except you enable dynamic memory, then everything changes. Yeah, exactly. A fixed amount of RAM. So it's a fixed amount of RAM if you don't enable dynamic memory. So startup RAM, if you don't enable dynamic memory, this is the RAM that is fixed for this virtual machine. But if you enable dynamic memory, the meaning of startup, the meaning of startup RAM change. If you enable dynamic memory, startup RAM now means this is the RAM that you can use when you're starting up. And here is the reason. Whenever you're booting any operating system, they use more memory when they're booting up than when they're actually running. Because when they are booting up, they are loading the OS into the memory. They are loading the drivers into the memory. But after they finish booting up, they basically let go of all the memory that they've been using. So when your machine is starting up, you'll see, I mean, think, I mean, look, uh, well, I, I can connect to my VMware infrastructure from here. I will have shown you. So if you, if you look when the virtual machine is booting like on VMware and look at the memory utilization, you see the memory utilization go to like 80%, 90%. And then after it finished booting, it will go back to like 30%. Because they use more RAM when they are booting, because they are loading operating system and drivers and all these things. Then after they finish booting, they are like, yeah, we unload the memory. So if you don't enable this, startup RAM means this is fixed. If you enable dynamic memory, startup RAM means this is what you can use when you're starting up. But after you start up, you can go between this minimum and this maximum. And does anyone want to think of what's the benefit of enabling dynamic memory? What would be the benefit of that? Uh, I think it's memory memory efficiency that you can use the remaining memory to to play with other Hyper-Vs, like uh, other machine, virtual machines, exactly. and be more efficient with your memory use, I think. Nice one, though. Nice one. Because, for example, what if this machine, on average, is just using one gear all the time, and you've not enabled dynamic memory? So what that means is that this machine... We we'll just keep the one gig that is not using, and it will just keep it that way, and not nothing else can use it. But if you enable dynamic memory, it can use the old two gig when it's booting up. But after it finishes booting up, the, it's basically memory on demand, memory as you need it. So the machine is basically communicating with the hypervisor. Oh, somebody has just requested to download a 
500 megabyte file. I need, uh, you know, I need 500 MB of RAM more. So the hypervisor is basically the master that's controlling everything. It's like, oh, you need more, you need 500 meg RAM. Here's 500 meg RAM for you, you know? So after it finishes downloading, the, the users finish downloading whatever they're downloading, it's like, oh, uh, hypervisor, here's the 500 meg RAM back. You can give it to anyone else you want to give it to. You know, I finished using it. But what you've now said is that this... My question is... Carry on. Uh, yeah. David, like, then, uh, I mean, this is the most efficient option I can see enable dynamic memory, and it's, it makes sense, right? Yeah, it does. Why do we even have this startup RAM thing then? Like, I mean, why do we have, have it even there? Why shouldn't we just stick always to dynamic? Is there a spe specific, special reason to have that option? Good question, Zo. Does anyone want to answer that? Good, good infrastructure question. David says first, it needs RAM to load operating system, actually. So you can't enable dynamic RAM at the start because it doesn't know how much RAM it's need to start the operating system. That's a good that's a good one also, but there's another good reason. Why would you want to set this one to static all the time rather than use dynamic memory all the time? You know, just take away this one. Why why do you have, why do you even have to why don't you want why would you ever want to use this one and disable this one? Faster startup time maybe. Uh, what what did you say, Mark? Could it be something like maybe a faster boot time? Uh, yeah, that's part of it. But there's a particular infrastructure reason why. Because Another reason maybe be Exchange or when you run uh, exactly. MySQL. There are some servers in your infrastructure that are so important that you have to guarantee resources to them. You know, what if your you know all your machines are sharing the memory and all of a sudden there's this little developer server that is you know, programmer is using to program, practice his programming. And he says, oh, I need 15 gig of RAM. And the professor goes, oh, exchange, sorry. We need to take more RAM from you. So you don't want that kind of a situation for really important servers on your infrastructure. You want to guarantee resources to them. So if you have really important servers, you're like, this server is really, really important. Actually, you know what? Microsoft will not support you if you virtualize your Exchange server or you virtualize your SQL server. They won't support you except you guarantee resources to them. If you call Microsoft support and say, I have this virtualized Exchange server, it's on dynamic memory, the first thing they'll tell you, take it off. We don't support that. One of the things that they, that they use when you're, when, when you're installing Exchange on the virtualized environment is that you must guarantee it these resources, these resources, these resources. Then if you have problems with it, you can call us, we will support you. Otherwise, don't call us, we won't support you. So there are some servers that are, does that answer your question though? There are some servers that are really important. You have to guarantee them resources. Yes, yes, yes. thanks. So that, that, that's one of the reasons. So you want to guarantee resources, just take away dynamic memory. But maybe there are some servers that you're like, yeah, you can share things with one another, you know. Enable dynamic memory. So you're saying minimum, you're saying whatever happens, don't go below 512. Whatever happens, don't go above this one. But you actually, can carry on. Actually, just minimum RAM have to be the minimum startup RAM. I think that's what it type here. It have to be minimum 248. No. no, actually, best practice is minimum RAM to be lower than startup RAM. All right, I see. Yeah, yeah. because it can give back. Because when it's, when it's starting up, it uses more memory. So it can give back memory that is not using after it has finished starting up. Otherwise, All right. otherwise, this is basically why not just disable this one because this is the same. You're basically still saying minimum is basically saying I'm guaranteeing you two gig. Hmm. You get the point? Because this is also like a guarantee. You say you can't go below this. So no matter what, it will have two gig. So minimum best practice it has to be lower than your startup RAM. Otherwise, the whole Practice. Yeah, because okay, I see. Because yeah. that RAM is guaranteed anyway. Exactly. Yeah, and minimum RAM is also guaranteed anyway. So you're saying minimum, you cannot go below this, and maximum, you cannot go above this. So that's what it means. So memory buffer. So what does it mean? Anyone want to take on that? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's something to do with the memory buffer. Like if it's uh, going below 20% of the given uh, minimum threshold, the operating system is going to inject from the maximum RAM into that uh, memory buffer to fulfill that 20% threshold to 
bring it back to the minimum level? Um, not really. Not really. I think memory buffer is uh, something uh, when it is going to the new host. Yeah. Will reserve that much memory ahead of it, right? Huh? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take a look at the word buffer itself. Uh, buffer means like you have something extra to go on, right? Mm -hmm. That's what buffer Hello, means. Auntie. Auntie? So in the programming world, when we talk about buffer, mm -hmm. it means that we preload something. Mm -hmm. So what memory buffer basically means then, it must be you have more memory to go on that's mm -hmm. needed. Mm -hmm. Did you get one Mikhail? So just if you have a uh, limit of. Did you get what Mikhail just explained? So if you have limit of 4 gig and you have the buffer on 10%, that means you have about 5.5 gigabyte extra to go on, I think. Did you, from... did, yeah, that's a ni nice explanation, Mikhail. Do you get what Mikhail just explained? So here's what Mikhail just explained. Let me take off my jacket because it's getting a bit hot in here. I think someone switched on the heater <laughs> or the heating. Yeah, okay. So this is what Mikhail just explained. How many of you want to come to your server? And when you get to your server, you right click here and you go task manager and you see memory utilization is a hundred percent. How many of you like that as an administrator? You're like, wow, you know, my, 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 yeah, just opened all my servers and everything is 100%. All the memory usage, utilization is 100%. Do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You don't want your memory to be <laughs> to be 100% utilization all the time. If you don't want your memory to be 100% utilization all the time, this is where the buffer comes in. So because basically dynamic memory is the virtual machine is telling the hypervisor, this is the amount of memory that I need to run, what I'm running at the moment. So if it only needs 500 meg, you'll be like, I only need 500 meg from you at the moment. And the hypervisor will go, here you go, 500 meg. And whenever you finish, you hand it back to me. So I can give to other virtual machines as they need it. So you're like, oh, I need one gig to run something at the moment. Here's one gig. But the thing is, if the hypervisor only gives one gig to it, your machine will be running at 100% memory utilization. So buffer simply means whatever my virtual machine is requesting, add this buffer to it so that it's not running at 100% utilization. So if the machine says to the hypervisor, I need one gig, the hypervisor will just give it one gig. And then you go to your virtual machine and it's running at 100% memory utilization. But buffer now says, you cannot say buffer, well, Whatever you're requesting, always add the buffer of 20%. So if your machine goes to the hypervisor and says, oh, I need one gig, the hypervisor will be like, oh, you need one gig, but I've been asked to give you a buffer of 20%. So here's 1.2 gig for you. Do you get that? Is that clear at all? Stefan, is it clear? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what, what? Like... Carry on. Percentage that you will set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It is. Got it. What What about you, okay. Mark? What did you, Did you get it? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's the reason why you have a memory buffer. So because you don't want 100% memory utilization, so you have to have the buffer. So whatever is requesting, it will always have extra. So it's not running because many people have in their infrastructures they have uh, a Latin. And they have different alerting, like in my infrastructure, if anything goes above 80%, we are alerted. You go above 80% for more than one hour, it sends an alert to us, so we know something seems to be going wrong. So, there you go. So that's what memory buffer. Memory weight, what does that mean? Anyone want to take on that? Memory weight. It has got something to do regarding the priority of the uh, VM. If, uh, I mean, the highest priority assigned the VM will get the first priority but uh, one question that I would like to ask when, when we talk about priority mm -hmm. in this uh, scenario are we dealing with some kind of uh, resource or memory uh, consumption such stuff yeah so look at this so under this section what we're setting is we are under the memory section so we're not even talking about the processor 
or the ID or the network yet. So we're talking about memory now. So it says memory weight. So you're right because the word, the right, use the right word. The word is priority. And priority only comes into place. When does priority comes into place? It only comes into place when there's contention. When do you have to prioritize your work? If you get to work and you only have one thing to do, you don't need to prioritize your work <laughs> because you have only one thing to do. But when there's multiple things contending for your time and you're like, oh, I have to do this and I have to do this and I have to do this, then you have to be like, okay, which one is the highest priority? So whenever there's now an area of contention, so let's say this virtual machine only has four gig of RAM maximum. And this, and there are three machines on it. And one of them says, oh, I need two gig of RAM. And it says, yes, two gig for you. The other one says, I need one gig of RAM. It says, yes, one gig for you. The other one says, oh, I need two gig. It's like, uh, I don't have two gig. What should I do? That's when this one comes in. Because now we have a contention. So this one now comes in and says, okay, hold on, hold on, guys. Um, You, you go first because you have a higher priority. You, you get your own first. So based on the weights that you've set, it will prioritize the virtual machines when there's contention. So th this one is contending with a machine that is low, is contending with a machine that is high. The machine that is high will get what it wants. The one that is low won't get what it wants. If you set them both to half-half, they both get half of what they want. <laughs> But David, yeah. uh, just a question. Yeah. Let's say I'm uh, I'm using uh, Exchange. I have uh, virtualized it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I've given, let's say, uh, 14 gigs of RAM mm -hmm. as startup RAM, mm -hmm. meaning that I'm be using it as a fixed memory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So do I need to set a memory weight on the uh, on the VM? Look at this. So, the thing, the thing with startup RAM is it's guaranteed. No matter what happens, this is the RAM that you have. Nobody can take mm -hmm. it away from you. It's yours, it's yours. So you don't really need memory weights when you're not using dynamic memory because they are guaranteed whatever they are guaranteed anyway. So if this machine has basically taken this RAM, it is guaranteed to it. Okay. Yeah. So this one, look at it. It says, um, specify how to prioritize the availability of this virtual machine compared to other virtual machines on this computer. Specifying a lower setting for this virtual machine might prevent it from starting when other virtual machines are running. So basically what it means, if you translate it to a simpler term, is this only applies whenever there's contention. But if you're using... If you're not using dynamic memory, there's really no contention because this one is guaranteed. So it's basically you have it or you don't have it. You won't even start up at all. So which leads me to another question. If you use dynamic memory and there's no extra RAM, will the virtual machine start up at all? So will the virtual machine even yes. start up at all? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I said yes because I read something about uh, smart paging. Good one. Good Wait. one, man. You, yeah, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well uh, smart paging is a process where it uses the hard disk as a portion um, to just, you know, to dump all the information. It uses the hard disk as memory, as the RAM. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, just to boot up the machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, I don't know what really happens. I guess it's just uh, revert back to the normal uh, amount of memory that the machine will use. Mm -hmm. But the bad thing of smart paging is that it has got very uh, drastic consequences on performance and on the hard disk. Yeah. Yeah, very nice one. So, Zoe, Zoe, Zoe and Mark and Mikhail, do you, um, v v v can, do you understand what um, Stefan just explained? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So you see this option here. So many people think uh, if you have like maybe this VM here and this VM uh, is only capable, uh, sorry, this host here and this host is only capable of 4 gig of RAM. Yeah. And you, you're already running um, virtual machines that are using dynamic memory, and you're already using um, 3.8 RAM. So when you start a new virtual machine that wants to use um, maybe 512 as a startup RAM, but there's no other space, 
that will this virtual machine start up or will it not start up? If you're using um, static memory, it won't. If you're using dynamic with smart paging enabled, it will. Because what will happen is it will start using the hard disk as RAM. So smart, smart paging, you can find smart paging here. So if you go here, go on the smart paging, there you go. So here you can configure where to set smart paging. So it will start, but like what um, what uh, Stefan said, you 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 basically wish you've not started it <laughs> because the 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 speed difference between the RAM and the hard drive, even between the RAM and the and the SSD drive, is a lot. The speed okay. difference is really, really a lot of difference. So it's advisable by Microsoft advices that if you're going to use smart paging, set this location to an SSD drive. So at least you'll be faster than a normal spinning disk. But okay. it's still not advised that much because you're going to have a huge performance hit. It's going to be huge. Yeah. Okay. So let's move just a bit further. We're getting ready to round up the next 20 minutes. Um, actually, maybe lower than that. So let's move. So we've, we've covered everything in memory. So I'm sure that if anyone asks you anything that has to do with startup RAM, dynamic memory, minimum RAM, maximum RAM, memory buffer, memory weight, you can explain what it means. So then if we go a step further and go on the processors, of course, you can specify the number of processors that you want. Um, then resource control. We didn't go through this yesterday, but let's go through it. Resource control. So virtual machine reserve percentage. What does that mean? So anyone wants to know what anyone knows what this means? Virtual machine reserve percentage. Resource control. Anyone? Mikhail? A resource control. Hmm. Yep. Uh, <laughs> it's how you. How should I, how should I explain? It's like you have multiple virtual machines, and you have to share resources between those machines. Mm -hmm. And it's like dynamic memory. You share resources, so you can specify how much of a CPU power one computer can get. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it does. But here's my question. Does it mean that this, this, if let's say I put 20% here, does it yes. mean that that 20%, no matter what is happening, no other virtual machine can use it? That's correct. Uh, you reserve 20% of the total CPU gigahertz. So basically, you're saying, that you're, you're saying that whatever happens, this 20%, we're not talking RAM now, we're talking CPU. Whatever happens, yeah. This 20% CPU, no other virtual machine can use it. Uh, other virtual machines can use it, but it's like you have to set a relative weight too, actually, because it kind of depends how much weight uh, the virtual machine have. because some computers can use that 20% also if the relative weight is higher. <laughs> you know what happened? I put I put a little bit of pressure on Mikael. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> so Mikael, you're actually you're you're actually right. No matter what happens, see this this is a really bad setting for the real world. No matter what happens, this twenty percent is actually reserved for this virtual machine. Nothing else. So think of this like the static RAM. Like you've done this with this. David, uh, I have a question about this uh, static RAM. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you say that the static RAM is is there, like the let's say two GB, so it's gonna be there for you no matter what. Right? No matter what. Nothing so else can. Does do this it. mean that when you turn on your computer, if you got four GB of your RAM, so your host computer will be running on two GB, and then this two GB will be allocated to the virtual machine, or it allo gets allocated when the virtual machine starts up. Ah uh, no, when the virtual machine starts up. That's it. So if you shut the virtual machine down, your virtual machine is not interacting with the hypervisor. But when your virtual okay. machine starts up, your virtual machine basically tells the hypervisor, you know, okay. hypervisor, I need two gig of RAM just for me. 
no one else shares it with me, just for me. And the browser goes, okay, here's two gig of RAM for you. Now, if you start it up and there's no two gig of RAM available, you get an error message that says you, the amount of RAM on, is not available that you're requesting for. So it's basically saying, so it's not as if it's saying, yeah, I'll take whatever is available. It's like, no, this is what I want. I need okay. this guaranteed to me if I can even start. Okay. Yeah. So the same thing for, for this one. Unfortunately, see this setting here, in the view world, you don't want to enable this setting at all. Because your CPU, you don't want your CPU, the way CPU works is the share time, CPU time. So this application is requesting for CPU time. It's like, okay, quickly run, you know, then it's like, you know, it's passing different application to the CPU to run one after the other. So, but now you're not saying to the CPU that, you know, CPU time, 20%, you are reserved. Even if you're not doing anything, you are reserved. You don't ever want that for your CPU. <laughs> So this is a really bad setting, but maybe sometimes you have some like maybe some I applications that you need to guarantee resource to, like we said. So maybe you can use and say, okay, I'm guaranteeing you 20% of CPU time. It won't be used by anybody else, no matter what. So that is what this one actually means. The one that you want to set, you don't want to be setting virtual machine reserve. Virtual machine limit means this is the highest you can go to. Memory weight is what, um, uh, sorry, relative weight is what Mikhail is describing. But relative weight doesn't affect virtual machine reserve. Virtual machine reserve means you are reserved. So relative weight only affects periods of contention. Again, think of it like the memory. So this one only comes into place when this one is on, right? Because this one does not come into place because there's no contention. It already has two gig reserved, no matter what. So the same thing, think of it this way. So this one only comes into place whenever there's contention. But it doesn't affect this one because this one is reserved no matter what. Do you get that, Mikhail? Do you get that? <laughs> no, I can't hear Mikhail anymore. The uh, relative weight affect yeah. virtual machine limit. The or, or does it only affect uh, how much CPU power it should get if there are heavy applications running? If there are contention, yeah. So this one yes. relative weight only applies whenever there's contention. If there's no mm. contention, it doesn't. So if you but the other thing is that relative weight doesn't affect the sub percentage so if you reserve the percentage the cpu won't be using and won't be no no other application or operating system can run on that cpu time that you've reserved is it good or bad practice to reserve cpu power it's generally bad practice except you have some type of important application in your business that if this application does not get 80 percent cpu will lose millions of pounds <laughs> in seconds then you want to guarantee <laughs> you want to guarantee so it, it's only useful in exceptional cases but otherwise you don't want your cpu ever to be sitting down without doing anything Ever. Yeah, right. You know, you can do that for your RAM, you know, but for CPU, CPU is limited compared to RAM, much more limited compared to RAM. So you don't ever want your CPU sitting there, except there's a really good reason for it. Compatibility. Anyone, any idea? Compatibility. I think we'll probably stop today at NUMA. <laughs> yeah. Ah, well, carry on, Mark. You said something. Well, going back to the... Uh... The processor, the one we were just talking about. Yeah. Now, in what instance, what case would you want to allocate or set up more than one virtual processor? Is it based on if the software needs needs it, or I mean, does it give you any actual benefits? It is the best practice that I use um, in the environment where I work. It's the best practice I follow. I generally. Uh, ah, so, so you want to say something, um, Michael? You want to say go here. Ah, yeah, that's right. So that's why I'm muting. <laughs> yeah. Just say it best, best practice. Yeah. So it's best practice that. So I usually just set it to one. Usually, you know. So, but then I leave my monitoring on. So if my monitoring on is on, and then I start seeing that this 
this one is really really close to 90% all the time I know it needs more CPU yeah yeah right so I yeah. know the application so but as best practice I, I usually just accept if it's an application that I know that is CPU intensive anyway maybe things like SQL and exchange and stuff like that but if it's just like a normal server maybe you're installing an application server maybe a server that will just run um, a software that you use for warehouse management you know so your users can connect to it I generally I typically I'll just give it one then monitoring would tell me if I need more CPU so if this one all of a sudden is like all the time this is 80% 90% you know 80% 90% I know we need more CPU so I increase that to two so right, that's right, why right. I use generally like as the best practice because CPU is, is much more difficult to, to gauge <laughs> Because you're, you're, when you're talking about CPU, you're talking about time. Because applications are scheduling time on the CPU. And their provider right. is basically saying, you know, you process five things first, then come back. You process five things, then hold on. You process the other five, then hold on. So it's basically doing all this within micro milliseconds and just doing all this. And basically, you go five, and no, here's the other two for you. So it's basically controlling like all this little, little stuff. So it may be enough. Just one processor may be enough for them. But but that that's why I just use generally. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so we can we can hand on time. Um, the next one that we are talking about is processor compatibility. Does anyone want to explain that to us? So your manager calls you and says, um, you know, a virtual machine, you know, <laughs> that we've just created. I noticed that you didn't enable this processor compatibility. It sounds like a nice word. <laughs> So, so just go ahead and enable I, it. I yeah. think the processor compatibility is something to do when you are converting from virtual to physical or physical to virtual, then compatibility comes into play. Mm, not really. Not really. What do you think, guys? Nice one, Zoe, but what do, you, what do you think, guys? Stefan, what do you think? Processor compatibility. Ah, we can't hear you anymore, Zo. Uh, sorry, I think you're muted, Stefan. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was saying uh, compatibility upon... Um, we said something previously about the X64 and X86. Yeah. So I guess it has got something to do with that, with machines running on the 32-bit system. Mm, you're close, but no, not really, because, again, remember, Hyper-V doesn't support X86, so <laughs> it's all X64 no matter what. And so, what, what, Mark? What do you think? Uh, uh, let's say we enable migrations between server. You have a cluster of Hyper-V servers. Yeah. Uh, and if one instance goes down, hmm. uh, and it runs a different processor hmm. than the one that's hosted the virtual machine, yeah, you have to enable backwards compatibility in the processor. So to by, allow it to move it to different processors. By processors, what do you mean? Do you mean AMD and Intel? That is correct. Hmm. So do no, you agree, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> Mark, do you agree? Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, I'm so, not sure. So are you saying that... Um, okay, so let, let's draw a wonderful diagram here. So let's, let's just delete all this away. Off you go. Bye bye. So let's say we have, you know, this wonderful cluster of Hyper-V servers that we have. So we have one, two, three. So basically, we've configured migration between these so that if a virtual machine that is running on um, on here here, if it if a virtual machine um, goes off, it will be restarted on B. Or if A goes off, all the virtual machines on here will be restarted in B or C. Or we can even configure it to say, if A is using 90% um, you know, memory, but B, you know, they are in the same cluster, B is only using 20%, and C is only using 10%, you know, all these, 90, all these virtual machines that are running on this one, start moving them to B and C and start distributing them. So that A will go back to you know normal percentage and B will be normal percentage and C will be normal percentage. So you can configure that. 
But what happens in a case where all these hosts on this cluster? What happens in a case where this host that you have in this cluster is running um it's sorry as intel let's just use that as an illustration you won't actually use this in production except you're a really really small business intel high seven and this one has uh intel you know let's say high three and this one has one amd processor I'm not sure what they call it. has one amd processor so will a virtual machine let's so let's go this one will a virtual machine that is on a will it be able to move to b if you enable processor compatibility yes it will it will but it will not move to amd do you agree or do you disagree with um ravikant yes i i will agree with that yeah, no, as I'm asking people whether they agree with you. Mikhail, what do you I think? Haven't, I haven't read the specifications, actually, on whether it can move to Intel, AMD, or backwards. Yeah, the thing. Vaficant is right. It can only move between processors of the same manufacturer. Not between AMD and Intel. It won't work. It would never work because their implementation of processor, even though they have, they have the same features, their implementation is completely different. I think same architecture is, uh, I would say, same architecture. Yeah, same family. Exactly. exactly. So here's the thing, is that this one, but the thing is, i7 may have some features that ITV doesn't have. So for this virtual machine to move from here and start on here, you need to enable this one you need to enable compatibility if you don't enable compatibility you won't be able to move this virtual machine from here to here but if you enable compatibility what it will do is that the new features that intel high 7 supports it won't use them so it won't use those new features so that you can move this one to this one so this one is basically operating like an i3 this one is basically operating like an ITV. It's not using all the new features of i7. So it can move from here to here and still think, well, I'm still operating on the same processor. So what they call it, it will mask those features. It will mask them away. But it, uh, won't, it won't move between here and here, never. I'm not sure if you have time for it, but how does the hyperism know that you have an i3 and i7? It does definitely. I mean, the, I, when you when you install, let's go, let's go. Um, it's it's not needed, but but enable cluster is that when you specify. It's the same way, like you know, when you go to your BIOS, how does your BIOS know the uh, the the um the processor that you have? Your BIOS knows your processor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. It does. So they they definitely know exactly what what type of um. So actually, if, if I if we were able to power on a VM, like for example, like on this one, this is my um, VMware VM, right? If I go, let's go this VMware VM, and let's go on the properties here, our oh, computer. Okay, this PC. So let's go properties. So it will actually recognize the physical. Um, processor that I've got. So this this processor that it's recognizing, this one, is basically the processor of this this one. So if I go to this one, which is the OS that it's running on, and I go computer, or no, this PC properties. So this is the processor that I have on this OS. But this virtual machine can it recognizes it immediately, definitely. So that's how Hyper-V knows what processor it's using on that VM. Exactly. So your BIOS ah, recognizes right. it, Hyper-V recognizes it. But, I, I, I... yeah, compatibility again, just remember, when you enable compatibility, it will only allow you to move between uh, processors of the same manufacturer and family. It won't allow you to move between manufacturers. So they are... So, so if there's i7, can it go to Intel Core to, like, Core to do what? That's the thing. Are they in the same family? Because Intel will tell you. Yeah. Intel will tell you. Uh, Intel processor families. Maybe chat. So you see certain processors that are in the same family. So you can only move between them. Because when they're in the same family, 
what it will do is that it will mask the new features that are in maybe a newer member of the family it will mask that feature and so you won't be using the new feature that that processor supports so it's basically it's basically like uh, remember your active directory where you have to select your domain um, level and your forest level remember so you can use a forest level of server 2008 and even though you have server 2012 you won't be able to use the new features So yeah, you have Pentium. Um, um, something that is clearer. Mm. Clear enough. Ah, it's, okay, it's yeah. a bit old, but it works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you can see a uh, nice one. Thanks very much for this. So you can see. Generation eight, so Intel, Itanium, and and can I see AMD there? Is it AMD there? AMD Sledgehammer and Intel Itanium. They're and, sort of the same. And no, no, this generation, this is not family. This, this is different. And generation just simply means like you know the advanced. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. So it's different. So. I think yeah. it was from a pair. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah, I'm sure. It, I mean, there's definitely like. So if, let's go back. Let's just go back to the web, uh, maybe. Jump to family, okay. Let's see. Maybe this one's got something for us. Family. Uh, 3,000 family? No, that's really old. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, but you get the point, right? So basically, whenever, you're, whenever you want to buy hosts, in your environment one of the things that you have to ensure as a system admin is that they are running the same processor because if you want to be able to migrate between them you have to ensure that they are they're having the same processor otherwise you have troubles so to conclude for today numa finally numa how many people have even heard of numa before no. <laughs> No man, this <laughs> it sounds funny. Um, so, uh, Mark, I know Michaela's. Never heard of it. <laughs> Numa. So what we'll do is we we'll, won't we'll go into full details about Numa, but we'll just go just basics, just basics, so that you have an idea of what it does. So that if you see it in an in an exam question, which you probably will see it in an exam question so so that you'll be able to at least identify when they say um what can do this feature you'll be able to say no numa cannot be doing that <laughs> because that's not what numa does so just a quick one to, to explain what numa does um actually michael can help us so michael you want to explain numa to us as we finish for today so after this one we'll finish for today let me just get back to numa uh uh let's see no mice has to do with migrate or lie migrations right not really no oh, no, no, no 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 of course not. i don't remember what numa stands for i think it has a non-uniform memory access yeah right uh no mice basically you can share memory between hosts that's in a cluster basically mm -hmm. so let's say uh, where's paint you have a Cluster of this computer right here, it has total of 64 GB mm -hmm. RAM. Yep. And you have another host right here. This mm -hmm. one has 128 GB mm -hmm. of RAM. So let's say this one uses everything. Mm -hmm. It uses everything of the RAM. Mm -hmm. And maybe you need have some more computers here or VMs that needs more RAM, then you can take RAM from this over here, mm -hmm. basically. Yep. That's what Numa does. It can share RAM between hosts. Mm -hmm. uh, you're very close, but you messed it up in the end. Share RAM between hosts. No, not between hosts. <laughs> it's within the same host. So let's go for Numa, uh, finally. Well, welcome, um, Aonika. So we have... We have an ID. If you want to connect with Team Viewer, you have just a few minutes <laughs> before we finish for today. 
so that's the that's the ID to connect to the machine that we're that we're using for today. So let's let's quickly go over Numa. So Numa is a, it's a technology that modern processors use. So what happens is on your on your machine you have your RAM, right? And then you have your processors. Maybe you have two CPUs inside this machine and you have your RAM. So what your what Numa does is that this CPU will basically divide this RAM on the same machine. It will divide it into blocks. It will divide this RAM into blocks. So now you have these blocks of RAM. And you have these blocks of RAM here, these blocks of RAM here, you have two CPUs here. It will now say these blocks of RAM oh sorry no that's the wrong one you know see this block of ram you belong to this cpu so you're together whereas this block of ram you belong to this cpu you're together and it will call them numa node so be like numa node one so it's a technology that modern CPUs use for efficiency. You will call this Numa Node 2. So what happens is that whenever anything that's running on, on RAM 1, whenever it wants to process it one or whatever it wants to whenever anything that's running on Numa Node 2, whenever it wants to process anything, it uses this processor. Anything that's running on this um, Numa node 1, whenever it wants to process anything, it uses this processor. But what now happens is that, let's say there's a process, let's say there's a process that's running here. Let's say, let's let's get a diagram back. Let's say there's a process that's running on, on here, and this process is now like, ah, actually, you know, this RAM in this Numa node, you're only 4 gig of RAM. And this RAM in this Numa node, you're 4 gig of RAM. And this one is like, I want to run something that is 6 gig of RAM, yeah? But the thing is, in my Numa node that I've been assigned to, there's only 4 gig that's available. I need 2 more gig. It will have to borrow from another Numa node. But what it will borrow from another Numa node, it will lose performance. Because now it has to move from its own Numa node to another Numa node to borrow RAM. So back to Hyper-V, how does that apply to Hyper-V? Look at this. There are two places that you have to enable Numa. So first thing is under the Hyper-V server itself. So you go to the Hyper-V server, you go under Hyper-V settings, and you have this option here, Numa Spanning. Now this Numa Spanning says, allow virtual machines to span physical Numa nodes. So what does that mean? Allow virtual machines to span physical Numa node. You've configured a VM, for example. The VM, you've configured it for 6 gig of RAM. Now, one Numa node on this computer only has 4 gig of RAM. Allow virtual machines to span physical Numa nodes means I allow you to go and borrow from another Numa node. I allow you to go and borrow from another Numa node. Borrow the remaining 2 gig that you need from another Numa node. You know? But if you disable this option, if you go here and say, I'm not allowing you... Now, look at this option. Look at what it says. It says, spanning Numa nodes can help you run more virtual machines at the same time, right? It says, it can also provide the virtual machine with more memory than what is available on a single Numa node. So, the virtual machine can use more memory than what is available on a single Numa node. It says, however, use of this setting may decrease overall performance. Because now, it has to borrow memory from another Numa node the performance will go down. So if you don't want that, maybe you have some really performance uh, sensitive applications, you're like, I don't want you to be spanning Numa node. I want the best performance available. You can disable this option and say, don't span Numa nodes. In other words, if I've given you um, um, 6 gig of RAM and your Numa node only supports 4 gig, let me know. Yeah, you cannot go and borrow two gig from another Numa node to run because that would decrease performance a little bit. So that is that option to say, um, that's the option that says, 
enable allow virtual machine to span physical normal nodes. Now, is that clear? Yeah. Load. Yes, it yeah. says clear. Yes, that is clear. But one thing, David, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's normal node, okay? That allows yeah, just spanning, right? Spanning, right? Yeah. But then you got. Then you got... Oh, come on. Then you got. On the processor. This too. Yeah. Then you got this too. Paging. Yeah. Isn't that the same that allows you to use a disk as a RAM? No, 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 not at all. Is not so now we're not even talking about disk at all. So disk is a hundred percent out of the question. There's no disk. So basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's go back again. Let's look at this. So Numa notes. Um, is a hypervisor. So it's a computer memory design. So it's it's like it's like um things that you find in new um in in new CPU architectures or new new computers. So it basically it says. Um, when memory access time depends on memory location relative to the processor. So it divides the memory block that you have relative to processors. So this is not talking about the, it's not talking about this space at all. So basically, again, let's start from scratch again. Let's yeah, 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 but I think you misunderstood what I said. Ah, okay. Because what I was saying was smart paging allows yeah. you to use this space as temporary memory, right? Mm -hmm. So can it use disk space as memory by using smart paging instead of NOMA? Yeah. Oh, oh. I say, okay, I see what you mean. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see what you mean. You're talking about um, what if what if you like, okay, disable uh, NOMA spanning, right? Yeah. Disable NOMA spanning. Will it be allowed to use disk space um, when it's starting up for that, for sure, and this is the reason why I say for sure, is because no man doesn't doesn't recognize anything that has to do with a disk. All it recognizes is there are memory blocks, and they are they are assigned to particular CPUs. Yeah. So right. you, you cannot move. So if you disable that, what you're saying is not you cannot move to a hard drive. What you're saying is you cannot move to another NUMA node. You're not allowing spanning between NUMA nodes. So that's basically what you're saying. You're saying I'm not allowing you to go to another NUMA node to borrow right. anything. So it doesn't matter if you have to use paging to boot up. I don't care. But you cannot go to NUMA node one and take two gig. Right, right. So if you enable uh, NUMA, it yeah. won't use paging to boot, right? It, it will it, use NUMA to boot. No, it will, it will, yeah. No, if you enable NUMA, yeah, exactly. It will use NUMA. But the thing is, again, remember, when you're talking about NUMA, you're not talking about some special RAM. So this RAM are basically the same RAM. So it's mm. not the same physical RAM on your machine. So it's not like... David. Yeah, carry on. I've got a quick question about this. Uh, I totally understand your point of NOMA node and everything. Yeah. Uh, you say that it's only supported in the modern processor and stuff. So, okay, let's say, how do I know that there's a NUMA uh, thing going on in my computer? Let's say I have got two dual Xeon processors and then I've got 16 gig, gig of RAM in my machine. Actually, Is when there I any way I can find out? Actually, when I say modern, <laughs> it doesn't mean like modern, like modern, modern. You're talking about 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> you're talking yeah, about since so... the time of Pent you're talking about since the time of Pentium. <laughs> also, so uh, to enable Numa, you actually need a cluster of multiple Hyper-E servers. Yeah. It doesn't work with one server. It it works with one server. No, Numa is, again. Numa, you're talking about one server. Yeah, right. So that one server, it will automatically divide its memory and allocate them to processors. But here you have two NUMA nodes, though. Yeah, but it's the same. This is the same memory. So you have a. So basically, you have a machine. Yeah. Um, you have one machine, and that machine has, um, it has one RAM in it, and that RAM is eight gig RAM, and then it has one uh, it has two cpus on it or maybe one cpu with two cores on it so it's we're still talking about within one single machine so automatically what it's going to do seven bits like two processors on, the, on exactly so it could be that or it could even be two processors in the g but it could be one processor with two cores so what it will basically do is that on this same physical machine it's not two different machine 
it will divide them it will divide this memory that you have and assign them to the processors into different NUMA nodes do you get that like it's like when you refer a node I'm like oh separate computer yeah because I'm used to node equals separate computer mm-hmm so it's kind of confusing for me, but it means that RAM right there. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, exactly. So he's talking about the same RAM. So he's not talking about separate computers. That RAM. Ah, oops, sorry, sorry. Carry on. Sorry. You can use that RAM on. here. Yeah. Will be divided between those CPUs. Good one. Good man. Good man. That's it. So basically, it's not talking about different computer nodes. It's talking about the same computer nodes. It has separated your memory and your CPUs and divided them into NUMA nodes. And All right. That's it. If you want to know exactly how your computer has divided your NUMA nodes, there's a way to know from the virtual machine settings. So if, you, if I go under virtual machine setting, which we have on this one, expand this, under NUMA here, you see, I can change this. Let me change this to anything I want. If I click this option that says use hardware topology, it will reset this NUMA topology to what is on the hardware. So if I click use hardware topology, so basically on this machine, two processors, are assigned to 6 gig of RAM. Did right. you get that? So that means if you want to as align your your computers properly, you won't give any computer anything more than 6 gig of RAM. Because anything more than 6 gig of RAM, it will have to go borrow it from another NUMA node. Hmm. Right. Because that is the hardware topology. So I can change this to anything, but if I'm like, the computer itself knows what the NUMA topology is. But if I want to say, go back to what is exactly on the hardware you can click this and it will tell you that is exactly what your hardware is like your hardware we have two processors that have been assigned to 6042 ram so yeah yeah any machine that goes above two processors has to go borrow processor from another number node any machine that goes above 6062 ram has to go borrow ram from another number node right yeah, so do you, do you understand the concept of NUMA now? Yeah. So actually, so let, let me see. I think I can we can bring up a quick question just so we can get you to to see if we can understand. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can find one. Question about <laughs> NUMA node 7410. There's a question out there uh, about NUMA node. So let, let's see if we can answer that question. Oh, if I have it, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> let, let me okay. Yeah, I downloaded it here, but the thing is, I want to look for the um, this one. By the way, is the one that is the same one that is in our folder um, for people that want to, you know, message Zoe. Zoe will give you access. So I have the drive, but don't I don't have access to the questions. <laughs> Zoe is the is the guy, is the one that's helped us with this. Zoe. I have Hyper V, but not the questions. Ah, you no, you the questions are in the drive. So once you get the access from Zoe, you have access to the drive. And I have access to the drive, but not the questions. Are you sure, Zoe? Is that is that true? I'm sure. The so folder I, is. The folder is called upload underscore misc underscore dot. No, the, the folder is 7410 folder. 7010 related docs, videos, edit. Exam prep. No, I don't have access to it. Mm. Can you type in your email on the chat? Now look at this. What do you think is the answer to this question? Question 106. Look at this question. So let, let's expand it. It says you have a server named Server1. It runs Windows Server 2012 R2. Server1 has two dual core processors and 32 GB of RAM. You install the Hyper-V server role 
on server one. You create two virtual machines on server one that each have eight gig of RAM. You need to minimize the amount of time it takes for both virtual machines to access memory. What should you configure on each virtual machine? What do you think the answer to this is? Can it be resource control? No. Why can't it be resource control? Um, because resource control well, has to do with process or no memory. There's no resource control on the memory, is there? No. Yeah, right. Yeah, so resource control has to do with only processor. So it can't be yeah. resource control. So can it yeah. be memory weight? Because you have 32 gig of RAM, they have more than enough memory. So it's not as if they are contending. Memory weight only comes into place whenever there's contention. So it can be memory weight. And it can be dynamic memory also, because it's not as if they are taking memory and giving memory back. Yeah, I understand the technology now, because yeah. to access the RAM, it has to go through the processor, right? Exactly. So this one, so it this this one, if it's accessing things on its own CPU, if it's accessing if it's accessing RAM and CPU accessing each other on this same NUMA node, it's faster. Access to RAM is faster. If it has ever has to cross to NUMA node one, the time goes down. Because if you have one, okay, let's say you have two CPUs, mm -hmm. 32 GB of RAM, what it says here. Yeah. And it's and you have a application that's used a lot of CPU on yeah. the CPU one. Yeah. Then the computer can access the RAM on com CPU two. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because it's slower to access it through exactly. CPU one. Exactly. Exactly. So if it tries to access the RAM on that other place, it will become slower. So you don't want them to be taking time. So what you have to do is just use the hardware topology. You know, don't allow them to be crossing normal nodes around. Because yeah, if they are crossing yeah. normal nodes. The, the, the time to access goes down. Yeah, because it's bit unclear how NOMA works. Yeah. So basically, it's, it, it lets you access the yeah. RAM faster. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. And it will help you to, under, to answer questions like this one when they start asking you and they start asking you this one. Instantly, NOMA topology won't confuse you. Because once you see it, you're like, which virtual, you're like you need to ensure that whenever the machine starts, you can connect using PIGZ. You automatically know it has nothing to do with NUMA. So one of the right. reasons why they keep putting NUMA is because people will be like, I have, never, I have not heard NUMA before. I don't even understand what it means. Maybe the answer is NUMA. Who knows? <laughs> but now you know what NUMA means. So might yeah. not stand confused with NUMA when you go for the exam. Okay, now it's hanging out with you guys today. I need to go now to go before my wife gets upset. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the recording for this session will be up. So I'll be posting this session, not the other session. Yeah. No problems, Michael. No problems, guys. Yeah. Uh, David, when will you be available on Skype? On Skype. Tomorrow.